Welcome to 11 o'clock worship. Welcome if you are here live. Welcome if you're watching us on cable on Thursday night or streaming us through the internet. Uh, a quick word about last Sunday. As you know, we interviewed 10 different college students. If you missed any of those and want to see them, all three services are online on YouTube. So you can see all of those conversations with those 10 college students. Um, a couple other announcements I want to bring your attention to. If you go to the inside page of your bulletin, um, this Wednesday we are going to undecorate the church. We need help. So please, sign up on the Because You Count sheet so we know whether we have enough help or not. Also, we promised you dates, times, and places for this men's study. I mistakenly said it was a six-week study. It's a nine-week study. This Thursday, there are three opportunities to come and hear about it and decide if you want to jump in, men. So you can either come at 8 o'clock in the morning. That one's gathering at First United Methodist Church. You can come at 10.30 in the morning. That one's gathering at Grace United Methodist Church in Rocky Grove. Or you can come at 7 o'clock in the evening, and that one's gathering here downstairs in the youth lounge. Um, so pick one, and the information session is this week, so you can hear about it and decide if you want to do it. And then the following week, we will start in earnest, and it's nine weeks long. Also, if you're interested in knowing more about our congregation and what it might look like to become a member... Um, we're going to do a pizza with the pastors on January 19th where you can jump in and hear more about our church. Now, there was an article in the newspaper yesterday that some of you have seen and have contacted me about. So I reposted the original article to my Facebook page and our bishop's response to my Facebook page. Let me tell you what that's about. On the obituary page in the Derrick yesterday, there was an article about how the United Methodist Church has formulated a plan to split over the, sex, over the question of same-sex marriage and ordination of, of same-sex attracted clergy. What you need to know is this. Due to our governing methods, our, our polity, they call it, the way we govern our church, um, you just need to relax about that right now. Here's what, here's what happened. A group of people led by a bishop from Africa got together and had conversation. And the neat thing was, it was a conversation across theological lines, across geographical lines, which was great. And they have developed a plan and said, listen, here is one way we could solve this. And, and their plan involves the more conservative churches starting a new denomination. But they would get to keep their property. If you don't know this, this building we hold deed and trust. If we stop being United Methodist, we have to vacate the building. The building and everything that's in it is owned by the United Methodist Church. So their plan is that we could keep our property and go. But here's the deal. They would have to get legislation written and in front of General Conference, which is meeting this April, May, and the deadline for that legislation has already passed. So they would somehow have to get that legislation written, get it admitted as late legislation. It would have to be voted on at general conference. And once they get a piece of legislation, they can do anything they want with it. They can change it. They can amend it. They can substitute it. They can reverse it. And the authors have nothing to say about that. Even if general conference would approve this plan as described, then our judicial council would have to decide if it's even constitutional. Uh, some years ago, they made a decision at General Conference that clergy would no longer be guaranteed an appointment. And in September of that year, the Judicial Council said, that's not constitutional, and threw it out. Nothing happened. So there is a whole lot of ground to be covered between this idea that these people have come up with and that ever coming to fruition. So relax. Don't panic on me, okay? If you have questions about this stuff, always message me. Okay, and I'll help you to know what it would look like when that plays out, okay? So, I don't want you to be freaking out, but I, but, but I want you to stay informed. So, read these articles, but realize that the author of these articles has no idea how we do business, okay? And we do business in a very particular way. It, it's the same thing if, if one of our legislators at a rally someday says... I'm going to put a bill in front of Congress that says that everybody has to give half their income to the government. Are you going to panic? 
Well, no, that's just a bill. It's got to get through all these hoops. Same thing with the United Methodist Church. Remember, the same people that set up our federal government are basically the same people that set up our United Methodist Church. We do things in a very similar fashion. So that's a word about it. I just want you to not be stressed. Hey, I just, I just pray that today, as we get together and talk about God's word and how important it is, as we worship, that what you would have is a God moment. That some, somehow, some way in the next 60 minutes, you would sense God in a way that just transforms you a bit. That's always my prayer for Sunday morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you have brought us to this moment, to this place. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that this may be sacred ground, that this may be a sacred moment, that we could experience you, and in that experience, Lord, be transformed. We ask this all in the name of the Christ. Amen. And the good news is he reigns, right? He reigns. He reigns forevermore. I'm going to invite you to stand as you come into our time of worship and song. Amongst other things that we give you a chance to glimpse today is this thing that we call epiphany, and that's when the light drew those wise men to the place where Jesus was. So we'll just touch on that a little bit in a couple songs. Keep that in mind, but know that Christ came for all of us, the Jew, the Gentile, you and me. Let's sing. In the bleak of
Oh God, in these moments that you have given us today, we uh, come as an offering to you. Father, we thank you for inviting us to this place. And in particular today, Lord, we thank you for inviting us to join around the table of communion where we remember what you did for us through your son Jesus who came to be born and to die for us so that we may be born anew. Thank you for that invitation. And Lord, cause us all to remember that your love extends to all all who desire to follow you and, and live in a, in a deeper, closer walk with you. So, Lord, we come as broken people. We come with our flaws. We come knowing that uh, we have broken your heart and we do little to deserve your love and grace, but we come acknowledging how much we need it and how much we need you. So, Lord, as we just pause for a moment in the quietness of uh, just some simple music. Hear, Lord, the expressions of our own individual hearts as we just personally come to you. Hear us, O oh God, as we confess our sins to you. Lord, for all who call upon your name today, not just today, but in this new year ahead, we ask for your grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, who loves us, forgives us, and we give you thanks. Amen. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I see. Jesus, may you receive the honor. Now, with the promise of forgiveness that's there for all of us, greet one another as forgiven people. You're reconciled through grace. Share that grace with one another. Reach out and greet one another. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I sh sure appreciate uh, watching people share in the love of Christ with one another. And I am thankful today for this guy over at the piano, for Nick Swatzler, uh, taking some time off of his, uh, his college break from Behrend to share uh, a ministry uh, at the piano. Thank you, Nick.
Thank you, Nick. A perfect title for this, uh, for this time as we look to the new year, that God may be our vision. Thank you. As the team gathers here and we prepare for God's word today, um, the song is appropriate, and with it I would like to extend an invitation, an invitation to anybody who would like to join a group of us that have come together to read through the Bible in 2020. And um, my goal was 20, and uh, we are up to 19. So who wants to be number 20? That's my question. Okay, we have 20. Who wants to be 21? It doesn't have to stop at 21. Okay. You can see me afterwards, and I'll explain the process. But I will say this, it's not difficult. And it's not something to take the place of what you do in your devotional time. But I trust it's something that will complement it well. A group of us have started on January 1, and already I think most, if not all, have seen a pattern starting to develop of God's covenant with His people from the very beginning. And uh, I just was reminded once again that you cannot understand the New Testament without understanding how God began to develop His story to His people. You just can't. You can find verses that help for a moment or help for the situation, but to understand God's developing and His eternal plan for His people, uh, we need to, to read more of it. So this is, a, I trust, a, a user-friendly way to do it. See me if you'd like. Remember, the words of God, they're ancient, but they're so current. They're words of life, they're words of hope. They help us cope with all that we face today. And holy words, long preserved for our walk.
come. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Thank you, team. Good morning again, church. So as you notice, up here on the altar rail, we have a collection of Bibles. I have eight Bibles up here that are significant in my life, um, some more than others. Um, We'll be talking about um, different aspects of God's Word over the next several weeks. Uh, But just so you know, um, a Bible that was given to my mom 78 years ago when she was just a small child by her home church. A Bible that I carried for many years doing pastoral care until the snap ripped off. A Bible that I was giving an ordination. I've almost never used it, but it has significance because of when it was given to me. A copy of the Old Testament that I studied a lot in seminary in Hebrew. Uh, it's, it's what the Jewish community would use. It's ordered in the way they order the Bible. And the back is the front of this book and the front's the back of this book. Um, it's called the Tanakh. Um, the white book, or the white Bible, is the one I was given um, some 45 years ago when I was uh, old enough to learn how to read. My home church decided it was important to give youth their own Bible, a, a very old Bible that someone gave me, uh, and two copies of the New Testament in Koine Greek that I was um, required to use in seminary, the little black one I bought first before I even got to seminary as I was studying Greek in undergrad and learning to read the Bible in Greek and opened up a whole new door for me. Well, how I view Scripture is based on the passage we're about to read. So let me read the passage to you, and then I'll make some more comments about why that's significant to me. So we are in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, reading verses 10 to 17. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, page 1697. Okay, Here's what... Um, God inspired Paul to write to his young protege, protege, Timothy. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lister, the persecutions I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here ends the reading of God's word. So, so for me, when it says all Scripture is God-breathed, that's, that's the word uh, many translations put, all Scripture is inspired by God. But the word God breathed literally means God breathed out. The words of Scripture, I believe, are God breathed out. There's no other explanation for how this book, these ancient words, as the song said, came into existence over such a long period of time and has such cohesion. As Sam said, when you read it from front to back, you begin to see a whole drama playing out. And the drama that you will find playing out is the drama of God Almighty, the creator of the universe, chasing us, chasing us, because he's in love with us. It it starts in Genesis, and it continues on to Revelation. He is chasing his creation, saying, I want to have a relationship with you, and nothing is going to stand in that way, especially not your sin. So here's some fun facts, if you will, about this book we call the Bible. Okay. Oh, turn it on. Always makes it work better. There we go. 
Um, I, I have a longer list of fun facts about the Bible, but I want to give you 14 of them. You ready? Over 100 million copies of the Bible are sold every year. 100 million copies every year. The full Bible has been translated into 532 languages. It has been partially translated, usually just the New Testament, into 2,883 languages. The Bible's not a single work, but a collection of works from a wide variety of authors such as shepherds, kings, farmers, priests, poets, scribes, and fishermen. Authors also include traitors, embezzlers, adulterers, murderers, and auditors. I'm not sure auditors are looped in with that. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Nearly 8 in 10 Americans, almost 80% of Americans, regard the Bible as either the literal word of God or the inspired word of God. 8 in 10. Women are more likely than men Older people are more likely than younger people, and African Americans are more likely than other races to read the Bible. So if you are a white male who is young, reading the Bible, you're in the minority. Isn't that amazing? While it took over a thousand years to write the Old Testament, the New Testament was written within a period of 50 to 75 years. And this is important to know. No original writings of the Bible exist. Let me explain that. No original writings of the Bible exist. Scholars call them no original autographs. So the original documents were either on papyrus or on animal hide, and they simply didn't survive. What we have is thousands of early copies that are hand-copied by men and women of God. An example would be this. Most of you know about the Dead Sea Scrolls found by a couple of boys. They're throwing stones in a cave and they hear a crash. They find clay pots and they find in there scrolls of the Old Testament. Presumably hid by the Essenes, a a, a sect that died out. They find in those scrolls a copy of Isaiah. It is older than the oldest known copy of Isaiah by hundreds of years, and it is exactly the same word for word, hand copied. That says something about how they treated this book, okay? John Wycliffe produced the first translation of the entire Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English. However, after he died, the Catholic Church exhumed and burned his corpse as punishment for his translation work. William Tinsdale produced the first printed edition of the New Testament in English, and he was later burned at the stake for his efforts. What did Paul just say in 2 Timothy? If you're doing God's work, you're going to be persecuted. Oh, evil men go from bad to worse. The Geneva Bible, it was printed in 1560, is the first Bible to use numbered verses. You thought those were original. Nope. They were added later. It's also the Bible that Shakespeare used and the one that the pilgrims brought to America in 1620, the Geneva Bible. The Bible is the most commonly stolen book in the world, most likely because it's available in hotel rooms and places of worship. And as I said in the last two services, that's thanks to mostly the Gideons. And I think they're okay with it being stolen. They love that it's stolen. Take more of them. You know, you want to steal the word of God, go right ahead. <laughs> you have no idea what you're getting into. Well, this is, this is a freebie, and this, this group would probably appreciate this more than the last two. Um, did you know that Bob Marley was buried with a stock of marijuana, his red Gibson Les Paul guitar, and a Bible? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> The Bible's the best-selling book in history with a total sales exceeding 5 billion copies. There are 93 women who speak in the Bible, 49 of whom are named. There are a total of 188 named women in the Bible. If somebody tells you women are not important in the Bible, tell them they don't know what they're talking about. The Gutenberg Bible 
Last fact, Gutenberg Bible was published in 1455, was the first book to ever be printed with movable metal type. They invent movable metal type, and the first thing they print is the Gutenberg Bible. You know, uh, ancient words, they really are. A thousand years to compose the Old Testament. New Testament is, is done rather rapidly in comparison, 40 to, or 50 to 75 years um, and yet we hold it in our hands. I have grown to appreciate this. I, I had a high view of Scripture when I went to seminary, and all seminary did was confirm to me that my view of Scripture was not high enough, that, that this is, is a book among no other books that even compare to it. It is a really impressive document. So over the next couple of weeks, there are four um, subjects I want to I talk about. We're not going to take a week each. But um, here they are, just so you know what's coming. We want to talk about biblical authorship. You know, who wrote the Bible? Who were the authors? Uh, biblical canonization. A canon comes from a word that means a standard. So, so this is the standard. Who decided what's in and what's not? You may have heard of the lost books of the Bible. They're not lost. Trust me, scholars have known about them from the beginning. There's a gospel of Thomas, yet we know that. Scholars have always known that. It was decided it was not inspired word of God. There were a lot of things considered that were not included. Who decided? When was it decided? And why is Pastor Darrell always referring to Hebrew and Greek? What's it have to do with the text? So we're going to talk about translation. And then we're going to talk a little bit about biblical interpretation. When you're reading a passage and you're not seminary trained, how are you to understand it? What are some important things to consider? What is a way that you, sitting in the privacy of your own home, without anybody else, can read this text and with some certainty know that how you're understanding it is correct? Okay? Those are some of the subjects we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. But today, we want to begin our explanation of the Bible's reliability by looking at one concept, and that's the concept of covenant. Covenants begin in Genesis and carry us right through to Revelation. So for a book that is composed over this vast period of time, there is a theme that just carries right through it. And covenant is one of those themes. So that's where we want to begin. All right? There are five covenants that I want to quickly look at. Um, the first covenant is called the Noadic Covenant. I bet you can't guess who that involves, can you? The Noahic covenant comes from Genesis 9. This is what the text says. And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those who came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It's called the Noahic covenant. It's God saying, never again am I going to destroy the earth because I have a plan. You see, the plan started clear back in Genesis 3 when the first people to ever disregard the apple terms and conditions, namely Adam and Eve, decided they were going to take a bite of an apple. And God said, what have you done? And he said, you like that, huh? <laughs> they didn't get that. Did you like that, Amy? It went right over their head. He says to the serpent, he says, um, Man's going to crush your head. What he's talking about is that one man down the road who is going to overcome evil. That man was Jesus Christ. The Noadic covenant is, I'm not going to destroy the earth. Why? Because he has a plan. That plan is Jesus. The second covenant is the Abrahamic covenant where God says to Abraham in Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
how are all people going to be blessed through Abraham? By the way, when he tells them, you know how many offspring Abraham has? None. <laughs> and he's 100 years old. Oops. That's going to be interesting. He, because one through Isaac, one of Abraham's offspring becomes a blessing to the whole world. That would be Jesus. Now we get to the Noahic covenant. This is a conditional covenant, they say, because it's a condition. Abraham, or God says to, to Moses, Moses, I'm, I got this condition. Um, you guys can stay in the promised land as long as. Here's what he says. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. How'd they do with that? Because then he gives them the Ten Commandments. And they followed them to the letter, right? No. No more than you and I follow God's word to the letter. We have the same common problem. It's called sin. God began back in Genesis 3 saying, I'm going to fix this with my son. He gets to the law and he says, you want a standard? Here's my standard. Because what was happening is the people were saying, hey, look, we're pretty good because there were no laws. You know, in Montana, the speed limit is drive at a safe, prudent speed. That's the daytime speed limit. So if you and I are driving through Montana, you think we're going to drive at the same speed? I got one speed, pedal in the rug. Somebody last hour came through, through and, and said to me, they said, you know, it's kind of interesting you would say that today because I looked you up the other day and, uh, and, and, and I saw that you had a speeding ticket back in 2015. I said, oh yeah, yeah. I've had more than one in my lifetime. I come from a long family of speeders. I don't know why, we just, just who we are. But, you know, at, at that time, everybody was kind of doing their own thing, and, and they were saying, God, we're not that bad. And God said, let me tell you what my standard is. Here's my standard. And they said, oh, my gosh, nobody can meet that. He said, exactly. You can't meet my standard because my standard is be perfect as I'm perfect. You can't meet that. You're going to have to wait for my son. You're going to have to wait for this new covenant. Well, there's another covenant that isn't, the word covenant isn't even used in this passage, but other places in the Bible it's referred to as a covenant, and that's the Davidic covenant, where in 2 Samuel 7, God says to David, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, if you know anything about biblical history, you know that David was a great king, his son Solomon was a great king, but within a few generations, what had happened? (laughs) Divided kingdom off into exile, they lose the promised land, they don't even get it back till 1948. It's crazy. What the heck is God talking about in this covenant? Who's going to establish David's kingdom forever? Jesus. That's why the very first thing that Matthew does in the Gospel of Matthew is give you Jesus' genealogy and traces it right back to David. Because it's his kingdom that's going to continue. Which brings us to the new covenant. You see, in Jeremiah 31, a text that was written probably 500 years before the birth of Jesus, we hear these words off the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. That's the promise. Find in Jeremiah. Look, this new covenant's coming. And when does it come? Well, in Galatians, Paul records it. Brothers and sisters, 
Let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What Paul is saying is, listen, that promise made to Abraham, that he would bless the whole nation through him, is still going to come to pass, and here it is. It came to pass in Jesus Christ. That's the fulfillment of that covenant. So what's the law for? Well, Romans 3 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of sin. We figured out, oh my gosh, we've screwed up. We need a Savior. And this new covenant has been offered to us. It's a whole new way of understanding who God is. God's been chasing us since Genesis, saying, I want a relationship with my people. And if it takes giving up my son, giving up equality with the father, that's not too great a price to pay because I want to be able to forgive them their sins so we can once again connect. Because if they come into my presence in their current condition, they will die. My holiness will consume them. Somehow we need to get rid of this stain of sin. And the only way we can do that is if I provide a way for them. They can't do it on their own. He chased us clear into the New Testament until he established this way of forgiveness. Communion, guys, is the way we recall this new covenant. It, it, it's our way of understanding what God longed to do for us, with us. The neat thing about communion is it, it's a way of remembering that God gave so that we could be saved. It's for everybody. It, it, it's not established for a handful of people. It's not established only for members of the church. It's established for everyone to remember God's grace, to remember his love. For years, I taught a Bible study called Disciple, Becoming Disciples Through Bible Study. It's a, a 34-week Bible study. Yeah, you heard me right, 34 weeks. We're doing a nine-week study for dads, or for men, called Fathered by God. Disciple was 34 weeks long. You read 30 to 45 minutes a day, six days a week, and the day you didn't read, you sat in class with me for two and a half hours. That sounds like a college course, doesn't it? People would come away, we read 70% of the Bible, 70%. And people went, oh my gosh, I understand God's story better than I ever have. They could see his love in Genesis, clear to Revelation how God was working to call his people back to himself. What an amazing experience. But today we're going to celebrate this sacrament of communion and we're going to use it as a way of remembering that God's covenant is still applicable for you and for me. It's still the way we remember what God has done for us. And in the weeks to come, we're going to talk more about the reliability of this thing called the Bible. If you have questions, if you've heard things, if you've read articles, if you've studied things, if professors have told you stuff and you go, yeah, pastor, I know other stuff. Hey, ask me questions. Send me an email. Send me a link to an article. Facebook me. Send me a text. Make an appointment. Come in and sit down and talk to me. I mean, there are some things, let's be honest, that you have to take on faith. There are some things that are still a mystery, but let me tell you, I've been living under the authority of this for a long time, and God has been gracious. Have I followed it flawlessly? Absolutely not. I'll be the first to admit it. But when I listen to God's word, God continues to transform me. Because into every follower of Jesus, God has put his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is there to teach us, to inform us about his word. That's happened just as recently as a few years ago. I was um, working on my doctoral project. 
and no one said, well, you really ought to look at this text. This would be a great place for you to find some support. But I, I recalled this text in the Old Testament. It's actually from the Ten Commandments. And I thought, I think that says something about God and his relationship with us. But, but I'd never heard it understood in that way. So I ran to my covenant group first, to David Jans and Bill Lavelle and Pat Lennox and Keith Dunn, and I said, okay, guys, before I go any farther with this, further with this project, I need, I need to check with you guys and see if you know, I trust you as men of God, that people have the Holy Spirit within you. This is the passage. This is what I think it says. What do you think? And they said, no, we agree with you. The Holy Spirit within us resonates with, with what God seems to be telling you. So I wrote about it in my dissertation, and it passed through my academic advisor and got to my defense, and they read it, and they said, yeah, you're good. Welcome, Dr. Greenewalt. God teaching me of all things through his Holy Spirit to see his working with fathers in the Ten Commandments. Guys, I can't urge you enough to get back to this. If you've never read it, get into it. If you've read it 400 times, get back into it. If anybody's read it 400 times, I want to shake your hand. You know, it's constantly alive. I talked about teaching disciple Bible study, and it was really interesting because when I was teaching that, the first year I taught it, I began that study married with two children. Halfway through that study, I went through a divorce. I ended that study a single father. The next year, I read it as a single dad trying to figure out where up was and where down was. The year after that, I read it as a, a single dad who was trying to decide if God had somebody else for me in my life. And the, and the fourth year, I read the same scriptures. I had met Sharon and began to date her every year single year. I'm reading the same exact passages and I'm hearing completely different stuff. That's the beauty of this word. It's alive. It's active. It meets you exactly where you are. A professor of mine said of the Gospel of John, he said, it's a book in which a baby can wade and an elephant can swim. That's the word of God. I don't care where you are. I don't care what's going on in your life. The word of God is ready to meet you right there and connect with you in really important ways. I encourage you to read it some more. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the way you are working in us, through us. Thank you for the way, Father, that you speak to us through your word every day. Every day that we come to it. Every time that we seek you in it. Continue, Father, to use your Holy Spirit to inspire us to encounter your word. Forgive us, Father, for the long periods of dryness that we have avoided your word because we didn't want to hear your truth. Remind us, Father, that your truth is loving truth. You are trying to protect us from ourselves. Continue to teach us through your word, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to come to the communion table today, I'm going to invite you to stand. If you uh, are used to having some prayer uh, needs and requests on the cards at this time, you may still do that and you can bring them forward as you come for communion and drop those in the offering plates. But for now, let us just focus on drawing closer to the Lord and in our walk and in our fellowship with Him today, okay? Let us stand. All I want held dear, built my life.
You may be seated. Let me remind you first off that, that in this congregation we practice open communion. Here's what that means. You're all welcome. It's for all of you. God says, as long as you say, listen, I need help here, Lord. I, I, don't, I, don't, I know I can't do this on my own. That's the only requirement. You, this may be your first time in church in decades. First time ever in this church. That doesn't matter. You're welcome to come. God is present in these elements in a very special, mysterious way. You know, when Jesus was together with his disciples... He took the bread off the table one night when they were having Passover, and he said, um, this bread is my body. This bread is broken, just like my body is about to be broken, and it's being broken for you. After supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you so that you could experience this forgiveness that you desperately need. He says, every time you eat this bread, every time you drink from this cup, you remember me and what I've done for you. Father God, we pray that you would pour out your blessing upon these gifts of bread and of juice, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood in service to all the world. May we be the light, Father, that shines in the darkness, the salt that seasons the earth and all those we encounter. May we share with others the hope that we have found in you, that they may come into a loving relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for this reminder of your love for us. We ask this in the name of the Christ. Amen. Would those who have agreed to help serve please come forward? As they are doing that, um, you're going to be escorted to the, to the side aisles. If you do that, come through. There's uh, offering plates here for both offering and prayer cards. And then you can exit up the center aisle, and that will help the flow go better. You'll be offered a piece of bread with the words, the body of Christ, and a chalice with the words, the blood of Christ, to, to dip your bread in and receive it. Receive these elements in, in, in faith. And know that God loves you right where you are. But he loves you too much to let you stay there. He wants so much more out of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for pouring into us your love in incredible measure. Lord, I just pray that we would not leave this place till we know that we know that we know that we are loved by you, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've come from, no matter what anyone has ever told us, you do love us. Thank you for that, Father. We need that this day. Now, Father, send us out with your grace, with your mercy, with your peace. In Jesus' name. Amen.